story, telling the story of the 1920s and 30s prohibition outlaw era and the Herber family's involvement in all of that back south of Kadoka in the nearby Weta Valley. Do I say what that right? Is it Weta Valley? Uh, that's Weta. Weta! Weta. <laughs> I, I had a feeling I didn't quite have, have that exactly right. This is That's the voice, by the way, of Shaley Herber, who is joining us to talk about the history of the family and the and the distillery that both then and now. Welcome to the program. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. First of all, you don't look old enough to be involved in a distillery. <laughs> Are you even 21 years old? I, I'm 22. You're 20. <laughs> you're 22 years old. Holy cow! So, so I've heard all this stuff, and we talked right, but you weren't, you hadn't quite yet arrived here, uh, back at the studio. But we were talking about your family's history, and uh, right before we went to the last break. And here's my first question: Are these stories true? Yes. They are. Yes, sir. <laughs> Holy cow, that's a lot of fun. So tell us a little bit about, because uh, there were probably a lot of people that didn't hear me yammering on about this, and they'd rather hear you anyway. So tell us a little bit about, the, well, we're going to get to what y'all are doing now, but tell us about the background of the family back in the 20s and 30s. Sure. So back in the late 1920s, of course, early 30s, um, five of my great-great-uncles uh, were actually into the moonshining business. They were running, they're still actually down at the mouth of Sears Creek, which is in the Weta Basin. That's where we all live now. Weta. Weta, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be a pretty a pretty big town back in the back in the back in the day. Okay. Um, but when the dirty thirties had occurred, nobody could really find anything worth sticking around for. So a lot of people moved away. Uh, the Herbert family, a few other neighbors down there are still around, but Weta, the only thing that's really left right now are a few foundations. Um, either way, back to my family. Uh, the ringleader would have been my great great uncle Joe and four of his brothers. They were running their still uh, and they were selling their very, very popular moonshine uh, and spirits distilled from corn sugar to state politicians, chief police all over the state, even the governor at that time. And their stuff had very quickly become known as the best tasting, most helpful, and smoothest whiskey in all of South Dakota territory. Uh, unfortunately, the feds had been watching the brothers for a few days. Uh, they were getting ready to perform a raid. So once they had decided that they knew where to go at the time of the raid, the feds had taken a warrant down to the, down to the house and asked the brother's dad uh, if they knew anything about about the new shining business that his boys were involved. Right. Now, about what year was this? This would have been right around 19... 30 or 31. Okay, all right. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no problem. So anyways, he had uh, denied knowing anything about it. Meanwhile, the boys were watching from the barn while this was all happening, saddling no horses, getting ready to ride back to the still of the Sears Creek to destroy any evidence that was there. Right. So two of my uncles, Edward and uh, Leonard, had actually carried off the copper coils and everything, uh, gotten rid of those. A few of my other uncles were... Uh, throwing the casks and kegs full of whiskey into the white river. Bummer! Which, <laughs> uh, which the Sears Creek runs into. Unfortunately, some of those casks and kegs had floated, so they had to wade back into the water, <laughs> knock some holes into the sides to get them to stay. Uh, some of the alcohol ended up seeping into a nearby well of a neighbor's house, and the feds had used just enough of that to uh, use as evidence against the brothers. And great, great uncle Joe, who got arrested for food like that, said that he was pulled away so hard that they were dragging him off that the fields had actually popped off of his boots. <laughs> <laughs> so did he get in bad trouble or what happened? He was in jail for about a year. Um, of course, about a year after this had happened, uh, prohibition was lifted. It was then legal to sell everything. Uh, Joe is always kind of one getting into trouble. He <laughs> right. Is he the uh, only one of the brothers that got in trouble? He had actually taken the rap for all the other brothers. Oh, okay. Uh, he was, as I said, the ringleader. He had paid his brothers to help uh, disguise the still uh, with shrubs, boughs, uh, trees, that sort of thing. But he, he was definitely the troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> so when it all came, uh, when all of this came down, he decided that he should probably be the one to take the rap and go to jail for all of that. Wow, that was, that was a pretty pretty big person to take the take all the heat for everybody. Absolutely. Now, were they able to reestablish the business uh, in a legal fashion later, or or was it all over? Uh, no, they had actually gone into selling burgers after that. They had. Yeah, and I uh, we've got an old family journal called the Lucky Thirteen. There were thirteen brothers and sisters total, including those 
five brothers who were into the moonshining business. And, uh, uh, I guess they decided that it wasn't worth going to jail again over. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now, are, are you at some point is the present day uh, distillery going to also sell burgers? Is that on the? Do you have a little in your tasting room? Do you flip burgers at all? Or well, no? you know, we're very big fans of White Castle burgers. We, <laughs> we buy and eat a lot of those. But <laughs> so one of the uncles actually went to uh, went to jail for this, and then have you? Or are there any artifacts left over? from back then that they didn't have to destroy or, or was it all gone? We had actually just this last year gone down to where we thought the site of the still would have been. Uh, of course, everything that was the still, including the copper coils, the kegs, everything like that, had already uh, been destroyed. But we did find some old pieces of clay pottery um, that they must have used for holding some or something like that. We've actually picked up all those pieces, brought them to our tasting room in Kadoka. We'll get to take a look at those too. It's pretty neat. That is pretty neat. Some of the uh, pieces of clay work actually have uh, the name uh, Kidoka South Dakota. Oh, so, wow. Really cool. <laughs> so now, did any of the recipes survive and get incorporated into your recipes today? There is one recipe that Uncle Joe uh, was responsible for. We now call that special reserve. Uh, back in the day, what Joe had done to make it is uh, Use brown sugar syrup to flavor some very carefully uh, tested, tasted distilled spirits. And he had aged it in a barrel for about two to three months before he uh, decided that it was good enough to sell. Um, today, of course, we, we had to change up the recipe a little bit since we can't make it the way that he did. There's right. protocol now we have to follow. Yeah, you gotta follow. <laughs> Actually, isn't that, isn't that one of the things about this business? There is a ton of rules and regulations, right, that have to be followed? A lot, yes. I mean, it can be almost overwhelming, right? It's just, it's, it's <laughs> kind of a deal. Wait, how long ago did the family decide, hey, let's get back in the booze business? That would have been right around 2015. We started talking about getting back into it. Uh, that was when my dad and my, my neighbor, I call him Uncle Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and he's your business partner, right? Yes, he's yeah. my dad's business partner. And his wife, Sandy Eschenbacher, uh, all kind of started picking things up. Sandy, of course, helps with a lot of the uh, making sure we don't get into trouble. She's <laughs> in charge she's of all the dotting yeah. the I's and crossing the T's and all that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. So were you involved at that point? I was not yet old enough. You were so not no. yet old enough, so <laughs> certainly not, right? I mean, Never. No involvement. <laughs> Um, so tell us about, tell us about, teach us a little bit. What's the process here for your products? So we actually use grain from our family's ranch to make many of our products. And so uh, my dad is actually in charge of growing that for us. He uh, grows it, harvests it, uh, he grinds it for us, brings it into the still, and we use that for one of our recipes, for example, uh, called Badlands Venom. And that is a 100 proof corn, malted barley, and rye uh, bourbon recipe. And so. Um, once we've got that all ready, we'll, we'll put our mash into our still after it ferments for about four to ten days. Uh, at that point, we fire up the still. We've got three parts of the alcohol that we that we cut. The very first part is the poison, uh, the stuff that they would say would make poison. you go blind back in the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that consists of methanol and acetone. We actually separate that from the alcohol that we use uh, to sell. The second part of the alcohol that we uh, collect is called the hearts, and that's going to be the desirable alcohol. Um, we usually start collecting that right around, I'd say, 120 proof or so and run it down to 70. Once we get to 70 proof alcohol, we make our, our third and final cut of the alcohol, and that would be the tails. The tails is going to be very low proof, oily, kind of watered down alcohol. We actually can save that and redistill it at a later time to pull out more heads, more hearts, more tails. It'll all just be lower. And then something really interesting with yeah. our Badlands Venom, uh, the mash after we're done cooking it, we actually take that leftover stuff, we bring it back and my, my little cousin Marcus Herbert, who also lives on the ranch, uh, feeds that leftover mash to his hogs. Oh, they wow. absolutely love it. <laughs> So now, what is your, you're obviously a fantastic spokesperson, oh, thank you. but what is your involvement in the, in the business? I do just about everything. I, uh, I am, will say, an assistant distiller with Mark. He is teaching me the ropes. Um, I help with the marketing. I 
up on the ranch every once in a while when I'm around uh, with Dad. Um, but is it, this is a full-time job? Yes. Wow, that's pretty neat. Thank you. So um, so Mark is the master distiller. Is that um, correct? Not quite yet. That took seven yet. years to achieve. Oh, okay. You can't just <laughs> declare yourself master distiller. Right. Of the, I got it. Okay. <laughs> um, but he's on his way, and he knows a lot more than I do, so he's teaching me along the way. And then do you intend to be the master distiller at some point? Is this going to be a lifelong deal for you? I would love that you to would? be my future, yes. <laughs> um, how about your product? So you have you have product available now, right? Yes. Or not? You do. It, it's available now. And it, do you have it distributed uh, beyond your tasting room? Or where, where are you at in that process? We can sell directly out of our tasting room in Kadoka. Um, we have a distributor in Sioux Falls, um, field distributing. Mm -hmm. So all over the Sioux Falls area, we have uh, Conkling distributing out of Yankton. And right now we're currently working on self-distributing over the um, Black Hills area, Western South Dakota. Uh, looking for a distributor, but until then, we'll be taking care of that as well. So you hope to land a distributor and then be available in liquor stores in, in Western South Dakota, is that yes. right? And then what does it take, uh, so our company owns the Loud American Roadhouse in Sturgis. What does it take for us to be able to uh, to pour some Badlands whiskey in the Loud? What are the rules on that? I have a feeling Sandy's going to say, well, we can't quite do that yet. Let's do it now. <laughs> so, to, how would you, have you been, let me ask you a question, have you been to one of the big distilleries around the country just to learn? Have you been to Jack Daniels or anything like that yet? I haven't yet, but we're planning on uh, hopefully taking a trip to do that sometime this summer. I'm pretty excited. We were uh, talking about going to tasting down in Kentucky and there I would get to actually learn how to taste um, sure so that would be very neat too I've already got a little bit of, of insight thanks to Mark Sandy and my dad Jim uh, but it'd definitely be cool to go down and see all the professionals uh, yeah get a little bit more insight sure how would you describe your whiskeys you know when, when you when you when you when you think of them along the uh, the lines of other well-known bourbons or whiskeys, uh, how would you, how would you describe? It? Well, I would say that uh, our special reserve would be the closest to um, just a traditional sipping whiskey, such as uh, uh, Jack Daniels, Jumbo Jack, uh, Maker's Mark, Petals, that sort of thing. Uh, we've got a few other ones like our Honey Buzz. It's actually made with honey from around the Badlands and our Herber's Ranch as well. Excuse me, our Herber Ranch as well. Uh, that honey is clover honey and it's spun, not processed. We've got a spirit called Branding Iron, which is a cinnamon jalapeno flavored spirit. Fun. Probably our most unique one. And those jalapenos are actually grown at my family's ranch as well. My, my grandmother, Barbara Herber, grows those for us. She brings them in, we cut them, dehydrate them, put them in the deep bottle. So there's a little bit of individuality to each of them. It sounds like you've made an effort for your product to be truly authentic to your region and your ranch. Is that a yes. fair statement? Keeping it local is very important to us. Uh, we love where we come from. We, we want to show everyone else what we have to offer. And right. It's pretty cool. And it's a, you know, it, when you get right down to it, it's value-added agriculture, is it not? Exactly, yes. It definitely is. We uh, actually got a generous grant from Valley Water Ag um, last year to help us in our marketing area. And that has been extremely useful. Uh, we're very thankful for that. Now, who's that organization that gave you that? Value Added Ag. Value Added Ag. Tell me about them. I don't know. Uh, they're out of here. Sherry Rapp is actually helping us on that. Um, Sandy would be able to tell us more. I know very little about, about that benefit. But. Now, do they get funding from the South Dakota Department of Ag? Do you know? Or? Some is federal. Federal. It's federal. All right. But there, so there are programs that can help. Uh, help help to fund and finance this kind of thing. Yes, and we actually got that grant because we do use our own corn. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> so now this is a um, is this an expensive endeavor to grow to to start and grow? I mean, it, it seems like it would be really <laughs> expensive, is it? Especially that's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that it was it was probably expensive. So you're kind of just trying to. Grow it as you go, right? Or yes. do you are you do you intend to take on investors so you can go bigger, or do you want to own it all with your group you have now? Or no, what are you we, going we don't for? ever plan out on uh, we don't ever plan on selling out. We always want to keep it in the family. Um, 
that's that you want to stay you want to stay you want to keep it as a family business yes yes very much so what do you think uncle joe would say about i think this? i think he'd be very proud of i'm sure that back in the day when he was sitting around in prison that he couldn't hardly imagine that <laughs> just just short of maybe 80 90 years that we, his family would be continue on his legacy continuing on his legacy excuse me in a legal fashion yeah <laughs> do you use uh Joe's likeness, or are there pictures of Joe or any of the other brothers in your in your tasting room or anything like that? We do have a couple of pictures of some of the other brothers. Um, I think we have one of Joe. It's hard for me to pick up the brothers because right. I never got to meet them. Dad, ah, do right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Do you use them, and do you use uh, any of their history in your artwork on your labels or anything like that? Or? Um, on the back of our uh, special reserve, we actually have a little bit of the story, uh, Uncle Joe's story, and the brothers. Just because that is their recipe, we thought that we would honor them by yeah. uh, giving a little bit of their story. Really it's very fascinating. I appreciate your time. What all are you doing here at the Black Hill Stock Show? Oh, you know, today we just came out to we came up to hang out and talk with you, and and after this we'll probably look around a little bit. Um, I was planning on going to the ranch rodeo later on today, but unfortunately I'm sick. So oh, you're sick. Everybody is sick this winter. <laughs> yep. So you're going back home here pretty soon. Yes. Thanks, Sandy. And I'll look around a little bit now. Play around just a little bit and then hit the road. Absolutely. Well, Shaylee, thank you very much. Uh, you're a fascinating young person and a 